Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. As the National Football League got its season underway this fall, a rash of injuries occurred in the first few weeks, including to several high-profile players who are now out for the season with knee injuries, including ACL injuries. The anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, is one of the key ligaments that stabilizes the knee. It connects your thigh bone, or your femur, to your shin bone, or your tibia. And it's most commonly torn during sports that involve sudden stops, jumping, or sudden turning movements. Here to discuss ACL injury and prevention is Dr. Matthew Crow, an orthopedic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. It seems like we're hearing more about this this season, that there are more injuries, knee in general and ACL specifically. Is that true? And if so, why would it be? We have been hearing rumors of that as well. And uh, we're waiting to see as some of the uh, high school sports start, if that uh, starts to, to show up in our clinic as well. Uh, but uh, we were asking a number of questions about return to sport in COVID and all of the uh, uh, medical uh, thinking about this over the last few months. We really weren't thinking too much about uh, injury prevention as it uh, uh, factors into the decision making about return to sport. But I think the first two weeks of, of the NFL has really raised that question. As, you know, as many of the listeners will know, football, basketball, soccer, and volleyball are, are probably four of the highest uh, risk sports for knee injuries. And uh, over the last few months, we've seen the NBA uh, take one approach to restarting, uh, where they had a very intensive three to four week training camp before they were allowed to uh, get back on the court uh, competitively. And we saw the NFL take a slightly different uh, perspective. They cut out the entire preseason uh, this year and did much less. Uh, and we're wondering if because without spring workouts and likewise in college sports, without spring workouts and some of the contact drills that people are used to over the spring and summer, if they may be at more risk of these, these injuries. I feel like some of the most dramatic injuries that I've seen in the past watching football are when the players kind of bang into each other and hit a knee and then they're carried off the field. But why do activities like jumping or sudden stopping or starting uh, put stress on the ACL and cause injuries? Yeah, in reality, about 70% of ACL injuries are actually non-contact, what we consider non-contact injuries. And Certainly, we won't uh, uh, be able to prevent all contact injuries, as you said, uh, some of those uh, things that end up on the, the morning news or end up with uh, uh, people with vascular injuries and more severe injuries in their legs uh, from football injuries are, are not probably preventable uh, completely. But a lot of these ACL injuries that we are, are used to seeing, the 70%, which are non-contact, are in part related to a number of both uh, genetic predispositions, mechanical predispositions, uh, strength differences and imbalances between different muscle groups. Uh, and some of that can actually be trained uh, out of, uh, of players or uh, uh, participants' uh, nature so that they're at less risk going into uh, the season. So it's not a matter that you're making that ligament itself stronger or changing it in some way. You're changing the dynamics um, of the musculature around it. Is that true? That's exactly right. Yeah, we, we tend to think that probably only hormonal uh, uh, differences throughout. There's some uh, fluctuation, especially in women, uh, throughout the month, monthly uh, uh, cycle that clearly plays a role in it. But otherwise, we think the uh, uh, ligament is pretty static. It doesn't actually change in its parameters very much. Uh, but however, the muscles around the knee will change significantly. And it's actually movement patterns that play a huge difference. So if you measure people that, uh, that are at high risk, and this has been done a number of times by a number of Mayo uh, providers as well in, in the Rochester Biomechanics Lab, uh, but looking specifically at how people land. And you can actually watch a group of people jump off a 18-inch uh, box, and you can actually predict which of those people will uh, have potential trouble just based on their landing mechanics and, and some of the biomechanics of how they move. You said something else that kind of piqued my interest, and that involved females. Are women more susceptible to um, ACL injuries, and why would that be? You started to tell us a little bit about sure. it. Sure. Yes, significantly uh, more, so about three times higher risk than, than males. 
and this really became uh, news in the in the 90s with the growth of especially soccer and basketball uh, and U.S. women's national team and uh, soccer performance and we started to see a lot more of these injuries than have been seen previously. Women are at risk for a number of of reasons. Uh, again, some of them are anatomic about hip and, and uh, the bone makeup of their, their lower extremities and some of the angles there. Uh, some are about the uh, hormonal changes throughout the course of uh, months and years uh, that do play a role in ligamentous uh, health. And then some of them have to do uh, specifically with muscular imbalance. So women tend to be a little bit more likely to uh, be stronger in their quad muscles and a little weaker in their hamstring muscles. And we know that that's another uh, risk factor for these non-contact injuries. Do you always have to repair um, an ACL tear surgically? No, I think that's a common misconception that uh, uh, has come to, you know, come to the popularity over uh, TV and other things from our years of watching sports. But uh, no, there are a number of patients that will do quite well with managing these uh, non-operatively. Uh, traditionally, patients in their 40s and 50s can very routinely be uh, treated non-operatively. And the reason for that is that the ACL is very important for cutting and pivoting sports. It's really not important for jogging, running, and doing things in a straight line. So uh, there are a high number of people that we call copers, and they will do just fine with uh, non-operative management of these and get back to all the activities that they wish to do. And what we're really trying to answer now is what is the protective uh, uh, ability of the ACL to protect the knee from further osteoarthritis. So that may not be as important for somebody in their 60s uh, where their risk of osteoarthritis progression over 20 to 30 years is uh, not a major issue. Uh, but for our patients in their 20s and 30s, I think we are getting more aggressive with recommending surgery because we know that non-operatively treating this and leaving the knee uh, with instability chronically, even if the patient is happy enough with that knee, uh, will put the knee at risk of osteoarthritis. I was wondering if that proclivity toward surgical repair or not had changed over the years. I have several friends or family members who are my age or a little bit older who always say, oh, I had an ACL uh, tear in college or high school and I should have had it, I should have had it repaired. Yeah, and that's what we're, what we're really trying to prove. And a lot of the, again, my colleagues up in Rochester are really looking at some of the long-term outcomes of this uh, with Mike Stewart and Aaron Critch up there and really trying to figure out what are the long-term ramifications of an ACL injury treated both with and without surgery. We know that some of the techniques used in the uh, 1990s weren't really addressing the biomechanics of the ACL as, as well as we wanted them to. So some of those patients have continued to have knee problems. But the question is, in 2020, will a well-done ACL, will that reset your risk of uh, osteoarthritis to a lower level than, uh, than managing that non-operatively? What is it that you do surgically when you repair someone's ACL? We differentiate between the term repair and reconstruct, and there is a movement back toward repairing these, where we actually take the native ACL and sew a portion of it back to the bone. Uh, that's pretty rare and something that's uh, gaining some popularity again, but uh, generally has not been the, the repair or the preferred technique. The uh, preferred technique is uh, traditionally actually reconstructing this. So taking a tendon from some other portion of the body, either your own or from a cadaver, uh, and using that tendon to reconstruct the ACL and create a new ACL. And then we know that over the course of six, nine, and 12 months, that ACL actually uh, convert into form a new ligament. And so actually biomechanical changes that happen in that tissue over time. Is there hope that someone can fully recover like these football players afterward? And how long does it take if they do? The recovery is, that's probably the most debated thing amongst orthopedic surgeons at our national meetings is how long do these injuries take to recover? And we've been everywhere from 12 months uh, making people stay out of sport to trying to get people back at six months. I think most of us are kind of settling into a, a time period if people meet all the goals of their rehab of trying to get people back to high level contact sports by about nine to 10 months. Minnesota football fans will remember Adrian Peterson probably being the fastest uh, back in a long, long time. And he was back at about eight months. We know that people going back too soon will be at a very high risk of both tearing that ACL or tearing their other ACL. So there's 
uh, a high risk, and uh, that paper came out of Rochester uh, about five or 10 years ago, showing that uh, really for the first two years after an ACL injury and after returning to sport, you're actually at an increased risk of an ACL injury in your other side because you're still, your brain is really still learning how to use uh, your knee again. So there's all sorts of neuromuscular retraining that the brain is constantly doing, learning how to use use the legs at the level that it's required to uh, uh, play the sports that, that we uh, subject our, <laughs> ourselves to these days. What can uh, people do to um, avoid an ACL injury? There's more and more data on ACL, what we were calling ACL uh, uh, prehab or ACL prevention. And uh, our sports medicine sites in, in Minneapolis and Rochester and, and Arizona and, and uh, Florida all have now ACL prevention programs. And, and this is well studied from uh, really the soccer literature. And so uh, FIFA, who's the, the governing body for international soccer, uh, put in some ACL prevention exercises that they started doing. And they followed these very carefully in some of their high level leagues and then pushed it on down to some of their elite uh, junior leagues, starting with, with children as young as 12 uh, to 14 years old. And they showed that in the highest risk uh, group of, of young female athletes that the ACL risk could be reduced by 30 to 50% by doing some uh, proprioceptive ac exercises and some of neuromuscular retraining. So uh, that is something that generally recommends somebody see a athletic trainer or physical therapist who has that special expertise. Uh, it's not something necessarily watch a YouTube video and, and be ready to go. Uh, for, but uh, it is something that, that people who have, uh, especially children at, at high risk of, of these injuries, playing high-level sports should consider. What sport it most commonly has ACL injuries? Is that football? Women's soccer, basketball, and football. It, it depends how you do the math, but they all, they're all at very, very high risk. And so those are, those are kind of the three that come to mind. There's a lot of lacrosse down here in North Florida, and that's another one that uh, uh, comes to mind. Just high-level cutting, pivoting activities uh, where people are, are forced to make quick turns without uh, being quite ready for it. And people will tear their ACL stepping off of curbs and uh, hiking and, and falling off of bikes and things, but it's really those high-level cutting and pivoting activities that are the ones that, that are the biggest uh, number. How would someone know if they tore their ACL? Generally, it's associated with a very large amount of swelling uh, directly after the injury, a uh, period of time where uh, not always an uh, intense amount of pain, but usually a large amount of swelling and uh, a sense that uh, the knee is not trustworthy for you or you can't uh, uh, cut or pivot on it. And usually that's, that's where we see, we'll see the people right after the injury and we'll see other people that try to get back to sport over the course of a couple months and feel like when they go back out on the soccer, or the uh, basketball soccer field or the basketball court, and they go to plant that first time, it just doesn't feel right, and they feel like their knee is moving uh, abnormally. Is an x-ray sufficient to diagnose this? Yeah, an x-ray actually won't uh, diagnose this, except in rare, rare conditions uh, where there's actually a bone that's uh, pulled off with the ACL injury, but generally uh, uh, um, an x-ray is not. Uh, physical examination can be very useful uh, in the hands of a sports medicine provider whether it be athletic trainer, physical therapist, or uh, uh, physician. And MRI is really the gold standard of diagnosing this. Thanks so much, Dr. Crow. It's very interesting to hear. Uh, and so when we see these things uh, occur on television, we sort of know what they're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that, that we're all very passionate about in our group, and not just fixing them and finding better ways for that, but also uh, uh, really preventing the injuries. Because it still is, uh, from a public health standpoint, and for uh, our young athletes, uh, that amount of time out of sport is a, a really significant thing to really affect their career. Well, our thanks to Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Matthew Crow, for being here today to talk to us about ACL injuries. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.